Within every complex organism is a vast network of highways and signal lines which carry vital messages. The most familiar messengers are nerves. But a group of chemical messengers, called hormones, are also supremely important. A typical hormone is produced by a gland. The pituitary gland, for example, responds to a body need for fluid by releasing a steady of antidiuretic hormone. Although the blood carries it to cells throughout the body, it only seems to affect a few target cells, those which line the kidney tubules. Just how the cell membranes respond to this hormone is still poorly understood. But the result is clear. The membranes become more or less permeable to water and chemicals, which allows the kidneys to fine-tune the body's water requirements. The simplest model of a hormone messenger chain involves passive feedback. No hormone returns with a message to the pituitary updating the situation. Instead, the pituitary simply senses an increase or decrease in body fluid and modifies its output of antidiuretic hormone. But many hormone messenger chains are more complex. Most of us are at least partly familiar with one of the most critical for survival. We eat at odd intervals. And yet our cells need a constant supply of sugar, which depends not on our intake, but on our level of physical activity. Blood vessels carry sugar to and from cells in the body. Most of us are familiar with the disease diabetes, in which the body cannot get a supply of sugar to the cells where it is needed. In 1921, a Canadian doctor, Frederick Banting, and his associates discovered that diabetes was caused by the body's inability to produce insulin, a single hormone. Insulin is produced by the pancreas. Among the cells of the pancreas, there are about a million specialized cell clusters, called islets of Langerhans. Each islet contains two types of cell, designated alpha and beta. In the beta cells, insulin is produced and moves directly into the bloodstream. The presence of insulin, a small protein of 51 amino acids, causes the body to reduce the level of glucose in the blood. The insulin may act as a key in a membrane lock, opening the membrane to the passage of sugars from the bloodstream into the cells. Another theory focuses on the conversion of glucose to a more active chemical compound. Insulin may act as a catalyst, accelerating this reaction. Whatever its action, inside muscle and liver cells, glucose is converted to glycogen. And in other cells, glucose is converted to fat or protein. When blood sugar increases, the receptor sends a message. Effectors absorb sugar. The feedback is a decrease in sugar, which in turn reduces insulin production. Today, insulin is produced as a byproduct of the meatpacking industry and diabetics are able to roughly imitate the body's natural balancing process. In spite of their best efforts, the result is a wide oscillation over time. We might reasonably expect the body of a healthy person to do a better job of releasing insulin to maintain an average steady state. 
In fact, the body does much better because the homeostasis of glucose is more complicated than a simple insulin cycle. The body uses not one, but two hormone messengers to quickly adjust sugar in the blood. In the islets of Langerhans, a second hormone, glucagon, is produced by the alpha cells. Glucagon also moves directly into the bloodstream in response to low levels of sugar in the blood. Glucagon has several effects on different cells. But in particular, in the liver, it accelerates the conversion of glycogen back to glucose. So our insulin control cycle can now be modified like this. Decreased insulin is detected by alpha cells, which release a messenger, glucagon. In response, effectors increase glucose. This feedback will result in the stimulation of insulin from beta cells and the suppression of glucagon from alpha cells. So these two hormones act as antagonists. The action of one promotes an opposite action by the other. Together they keep blood sugar within 0.1% of a steady state. In another kind of homeostatic control, one hormone stimulates the production of a second, which directly suppresses the first. In the hypothalamus, receptors monitor the hormone thyroxin. If the level is too low, the hypothalamus produces thyroxin releasing factor, or TRF, which tells the pituitary to produce thyroid stimulating hormone which in turn is a message for the thyroid to produce more thyroxin, which is pumped throughout the body, including the hypothalamus, where the increased flow triggers yet another hormone, one which will ultimately reduce thyroxin. Somatotropin release inhibiting factor stops TSH. which signals the thyroid to slow thyroxin. And so we have a set of hormone messengers acting directly on each other to regulate thyroxin, which in turn regulates cell metabolism. Messages such as hormones and nerves create a community of interest within all organisms. Cells and parts of cells must act together for survival. They do so by constantly trading information between receptors, control centers, and effectors. In order to make the right response at the right time. To accomplish this, body functions must be coordinated by all important messages, which forge isolated functions into a feedback cycle. Throughout every organism, hundreds and thousands of these cycles produce homeostasis, the delicate balance essential for the survival of life.